Hello everybody, this video is going to be about titrations, which is a lab technique that we use in the acid-base chapter. So first let me show you the setup for a titration. I'm going to show you two variations. The first is what you've probably done in honors chem, where we have a burette and we fill it with what's called the titrant. We fill it with a chemical. We attach it to a ring stand. The burette has a valve at the bottom, so you can turn the valve to keep the liquid in the burette, or you can slowly open the valve and drop the chemicals in, drop by drop, into your flask below. Below you have what's called the analyte, and you usually put an indicator in it. The indicator is a chemical that changes colors based on pH. And so you can gauge the pH based on the color that it turns as you're slowly adding your titrant. You swirl the flask, you add another drop, you swirl the flask, you add another drop. A lot of times we use phenolphthalein down here as our indicator, it turns a pink color. Titrations can be very stressful because if you go too fast, you're going to what do what's called overshoot the end point. And so that's a problem. You don't want to go too fast. So in honors chem, when we do titrations, I walk around the room and I tell people, nope, too pink, it's too pink, you went too far, start over. In AP chem, we're going to do titrations a little bit differently. We have pH probes, and so we don't need an indicator to tell us when we've reached a certain point. We're actually going to use the probe to graph it on our computer, and we'll look at the shape of the graph to determine that point. The problem with using an indicator is that by the time you can see the physical color change, you're a little bit too far. So having the fancy equipment to calculate, to determine the actual pH and graph it, and you can use all of your graphing, you know, calculation software and things is very helpful. So we will have the probe in a beaker. We'll also use our fancy stir plates and stir bar to make sure it's really well mixed as we're dropping in our titrant. You can do a variety of titrations. I'm going to show you the common ones. In your beaker, you could have a strong acid, and you could be adding in, dropwise, a strong base from the burette. You'll notice that we start at a low pH because we have a strong acid, and as we add base, it starts to neutralize, and the pH starts to increase, doesn't it? And because it's a strong acid and a strong base, the end point ends up at pH 7. When you have equal moles of acid and base, you end up with a pH of 7 here because they're both strong. If you keep adding some of your base from the burette, you'll see that the pH keeps increasing and then starts to level off. We get this S-shaped curve. You could do a weak acid in your beaker instead, and you could add in your strong base. You'll notice that we start at a higher pH, and you should notice, look what happens to our end point. When you have a weak acid, your end point will be a bit above 7. Depending on the acid, right, it might, might be slightly different values, but it should be above 7. You could have a strong acid in your beaker, and you could add a weak base from the burette drop by drop. You'll start at a low pH, and if you notice, you're going to end higher, but not nearly as high as the previous graph. You don't have as strong of a base. And look at the end point. The end point, where you have equal moles, ends up being lower than 7. Another thing you could do is you could have the base in your beaker and you could slowly be adding the acid. 
So here this is a strong acid and a strong base. Because our beaker is starting with a base, I'm going to start at a really high pH. And as I add acid, the pH is going to start to decrease. This is a strong and strong, so my end point is at 7. And when I'm done, I'll have more acid present, so I'll end up down here at a low pH. It's more common to see graphs shaped this direction, but you should be comfortable when you see a backwards graph where the base is in your beaker and you're, you're titrating it with the acid. Here is the problem with titrations. The calculations get kind of horrible. Each step of the calculations are fine. You already know how to do all of these. You learned all the puzzle pieces. The problem is that you end up with a huge variety of types of calculations that have to be performed. And you have to know when to do each type of calculation. You have to know what point you're at in the titration to know what type of calculation to do. And people get a little bit overwhelmed. So you can find online all sorts of graphic organizers to try to help guide you in what direction to go, what order to do your things in, what your options are. So let me show you just a few quick pictures I found. You can see here, you have to consider whether you have weak acid, weak base, whether you might have a salt, right, a buffer present. I love this one. Someone did this one in their journal. Look at this one. Some teacher did this one on a big whiteboard with all sorts of ideas, every version of stuff they could think of. I don't personally find that super helpful to try to itemize every version. I think that makes most people feel overwhelmed. And when College Board throws you something unique, if you're on autopilot trying to follow a roadmap, you're not going to be able to be as creative. You're not going to necessarily think of a unique way to do things. So be a little bit cautious. If you want to find or make your own version of a graphic organizer, just make sure you're not relying on it too much. We don't want to become little robots, okay? So what I'm going to do is show you some of the, the common things you might need to do. We're going to look at a titration curve here, and I'm going to point out some key areas that have different types of calculations going on. So for example, when you start down here, your starting pH, you may want to find what the starting pH is. Now normally you would just do negative log of your concentration, but remember if it's a weak substance, you're going to have to do an ice table. Don't forget that if it's a weak substance, acid or base, you'd have to do an ice table first. But you already know how to do ice tables. And then you can do your pH calculations, which you already know how to do. Then, as you're starting to add, in this case, if this is an acid, and we're adding in a base, Early on in the titration, you're going to want to get a few data points to graph so that you can see the slope that you have here. In order to do that, you have to do some stoichiometry. You have to figure out how much is neutralizing and how much you have left over. And you have to realize that you may have a salt being made. And which equation do we use when we have a buffer? we use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Another important part of the graph that you want to try to plot is right here, your equivalence point. The equivalence point 
is when your moles of acid equal your moles of base. You may have heard me say earlier, talking about the end point. End point is when you physically see the color change with your eyes. The equivalence point is the accurate answer. The end point is always a little bit too far. By the time we see it change color, we've gone a little bit too far. So the equivalence point is literally the correct answer exactly when they're equal. Remember, not everything will have the equivalence point at pH 7. So be careful about that. When you're at the equivalence point, you don't have any more buffer present. And then you have to take into account that the reverse reaction might start occurring. You're going to have to calculate a new K value for the reverse reaction. You're going to have to do an ice table. Then you can get a pH. But you know how to do strike. You know how to do manipulations of K. You know how to do ice tables. You know how to do pH calculations. You know how to do all those steps. Another special point on the graph is what's called the halfway point. The halfway point is when you are halfway to the equivalence point. It's half the number of moles that it took to get to the equivalence point. What is so special about the halfway point is that a funny thing happens with our math. We end up seeing that at the halfway point, whatever pH you're at is going to be the same as your pKa. So if you want to find the pKa of a acid or of a, you know, pKb of a base, you can do a titration, find your equivalence point, work backwards to find your halfway point, and then you can figure out what your K value is. Once you go past the equivalence point, towards the end of a titration, you have used up all of the acid, for example, and now you have extra titrant left over. So now you're back to stoichiometry. How much do you have left? And what would the pH be based on how much you have left? So I'm hoping that while this list looks a little daunting, and keeping track of what you're doing when. I'm hoping you can see that you do have all the skills. I like to say that titrations are really practicing our perseverance and our stamina, especially at the end of the school year when everyone's starting to get a little bit tired, right? So I'm gonna do an example I'm going to go through, I'm going to use these numbers to help organize the slides so that you can kind of keep track of which section of the curve we are on. So let's do part one early on, right at the very beginning, before the titration has technically started, what would my starting pH be? The titration that I'm going to do is acetic acid with sodium hydroxide. I'm gonna have acetic acid in my beaker and I'm gonna drip slowly, drop by drop, sodium hydroxide in. Now, right at the beginning, let's say that we have 25 mils of a 0.15 molar acetic acid solution and I tell you what the Ka value is and I wanna know What's the first dot that I'm going to put on my graph? What's the first point I'm going to plot? If I want to draw this curve, what's the very first dot? And that needs to be the pH before I have added any sodium hydroxide. The problem is I can't just do negative log of this. I have to remember that acetic acid is a weak acid. And if it's a weak acid, I need to do an ice table. So set up your ice table. I start with 0.15 molar, 
I don't have any of these when I begin. It's a one-to-one -one ratio all the way across, so minus x plus x plus x. I'm going to use the 5% rule because x is negligible. Simplify my life. Here is my law of mass action. I have reactants over products. They told me the k value, so I'm going to plug that in. x times x over 0.15. Solve for x. Now this is the concentration of my hydrogen, isn't it? Now I can do a pH calculation using this number. And we have found at the very beginning, the starting point, the pH is 2.78. So when you've added zero mils of sodium hydroxide, you would put a little dot at 2.78 for your pH. So next, part two, early on in the titration, before we've gotten to the equivalence point, we're gonna say to ourselves, just pick a value, doesn't matter what it is. Let's say that we've added 10 mils. We've added 10 milliliters of my sodium hydroxide from the burette. I did it nice and slow. What I'm going to do is I have to think about the stoichiometry here. I have to think about what's going to react and how much will I have left over. So we have to think about the moles here. We need to know how many moles of acid are present. And we need to know how many moles of base are in the volume that we added. So let's start with the acid. If you remember from the previous slide, they told me I had 25 mils of acid. And they told me that the concentration was 0.15 molar. So in that 25 mils inside my beaker, this is how many moles of acid I have. I have currently, at this point of the titration, added 10 milliliters of this concentration of base. So when I've added 10 milliliters, I have added 1 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of base. You can see here that some of these are going to react and neutralize, but I don't have enough base here to use up all this acid, do I? I'm gonna have some acid left over. Keeping track of all of this can be tough, and one of the techniques that people sometimes use is called a BCA table. Before, change, after. I'm not convinced that I'm a fan of this method because it looks a lot like an ice table, doesn't it? This looks like an ice table. It is not an ice table. Ice tables use concentrations. What have I plugged in? I've plugged in moles. You may notice I plugged in millimoles. 3.75 times 10 to the minus 3 moles is 3.75 millimoles, like milliliters, milligrams. I'm just trying to make it easier to do the numbers. If that's too hard, just leave it like this. That's fine. I am okay with you organizing your thoughts like this if and only if you don't mess up and try to use this like an ice table. You will have to get these back to concentrations later, so be a little careful. We can see here that my hydroxide will be my limiting reagent. Now we're back to limiting stoic too, aren't we? Right? This is going to run out first. I'm going to use up all of the base. This is a one-to-one -one ratio. So if I use up one millimole, I'm going to use up one millimole of this as well. So 3.75 minus 1 gives me 2.75 left over. Make a little bit of water. It's okay to put water here because these are moles. This is not concentrations. Remember, we don't include liquids and solids in equilibrium. But right now, these are just moles. 
we also have made one mole of this anion here. This should jump out at you as a certain type of problem that we just learned about. We have a buffer, don't we? When I'm done, I now have a buffer here. I have this matching conjugate, right? So now I have to use Henderson Hasselbach, don't I? But you have to get back to concentrations. You cannot plug moles into Henderson Hasselbach. You have to go back to concentrations. One of the key things here is that you have to use the total volume. I had 25 milliliters and I've added 10 milliliters. So that's a total of 35. These mole values are dumped into 35, right? So calculate the concentration of this moles per liter. Calculate the concentration of our anion. And now, we can use our equation. So there is a lot going on here, isn't there? There's concentration calculations happening. There's stoichiometry happening. There's more concentration calculations happening. We haven't even really gotten to much of the acid base yet, have we? Now let's use our buffer equation. We have our concentrations from the previous slide. We know our Henderson-Hasselbach equation. They told us what the pKa is. Here's my anion concentration. Here's my acid concentration that's left over. Remember, I didn't use up all my acid. I still have some acid left. I plug in my concentrations, not my moles, my concentrations. And after adding 10 milliliters, my pH has gone up to 4.31, which makes sense because I've added base. It didn't go up as much as you might have expected because this anion is buffering the pH. It's slowing down that change a little bit, making it go a little bit slower. That's why the graph starts out with a small slope because it's slowly changing. Okay, next. We still want to do another data point during the titration. So you'll see we still are on number two. We're still early on. This time let's add a little bit more base. This time we want to know the pH when you've added 25 milliliters. We're still going to determine the stoichiometry. We still started with this many moles of acid, but this time, 25 milliliters at 0.1 molar gives me this many moles of base having been added. We're still not at the equivalent point, are we? We still do not have equal moles of acid and base. We're not there yet. We're still early on. So you can see this is how much we started with. All of the hydroxide is going to get used up. If I use up 2.5, I'm going to be left with 1.25 of my acid. I'm going to make 2.5 of my anion. Now I have a salt, I have a buffer, right? I got my anion here. Remember, I need you to be careful with these tables. These are not equilibrium tables. If you hate the millimole thing, that's fine. Use your scientific notation. 
It's just that these are such small numbers that it gets so annoying to use all that scientific notation, so sometimes people like to do these millimoles. So I'm going to take my moles and I have to divide it by the total volume. If I had 25 mils of acid and I added 25 mils of base, that's a total of 50 milliliters, right? So after adding 25 mils of base, these are the concentrations of the things that I have. Now I should notice that I need to use Henderson-Hasselbalch. So here are the concentrations from the previous slide. I have my acid, I have my corresponding anion. They told me the pKa already. I plug everything in. And now stop and ask yourself, should it be a higher number or a lower number? Well, it should be a higher pH because I'm adding base. So we can see that it went up a little bit again, didn't it? So on your graph, you would put a little dot at 25 milliliters and 5.05. Now, let's do the equivalence point. Let's put a dot on that equivalence point. We're going to calculate what the pH is once we're at the equivalence point. You might ask yourself, well, how do I know how many milliliters it's going to take? Easy. Because you already know how many moles of acid you had. So you just need to figure out if that's the number of moles of acid then that will be the moles of base. And you can figure out, based on the concentration, how many milliliters that would be. So let's see how that goes. Let's try to figure out, if we are at the equivalence point, how many milliliters of base am I going to have to add? The nice thing is, it's just a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So if I know this is the number of moles of acid in my beaker, then that's the amount of base I'm going to need. So moles of base, concentration of base, convert to milliliters because our burette's in milliliters. Our graph is in milliliters because our burette is in milliliters. And I see that in order to get to the equivalence point, I'm going to need 37.5 mils of base. Or, you know the nice thing? Sometimes they'll just tell you. Sometimes they'll tell you how many milliliters you need. They may not, though, they may not tell you that you're at the equivalence point. That is one thing that might happen. You may get a problem that's just telling you, okay, now add 37.5 mils. You don't know you're at the equivalence point yet, so you just kind of proceed like normal. You have your moles of acid, you calculate your moles of base, and you go, oh, oh, look, those are the same. So those are kind of the two varieties. They may tell you it, or you may have to be paying attention to notice that the moles are equal. You can use millimoles if you like. You can use those mole tables. If I have equal moles of this, they're both going to get used up. And now, look, I don't have any buffer left, do I? I don't have my weak acid, I just have my anion. Well, that's a little bit of a complication. What happens when you have nothing on one side? Isn't your reaction going to go backwards now? Aren't these products going to make a little bit of these? At the equivalence point, we have to notice that we got to reverse the reaction and do a new ice table. Remember, these are not the numbers I'm plugging into my ice table. This is why this method, while very common and very 
organized makes me nervous. Because if you plug in moles, that's, that's not what we're doing here. Okay. Concentration of my anion is going to be my moles divided by my total volume. And at this point, I started with 25 mils of acid and I've added 37.5 moles or milliliters of base. So here is my total volume. Reverse the reaction because you're out of acid. Acid's used up. No more. It's all gone. We don't care about the water because that's a liquid. And now I have the concentration of the anion that we made. Minus x plus x plus x. 5% rule. And now we have another little complicating factor. They gave us the Ka, didn't they? Because they gave us for our acid. This is not an acid. This is base. This is the conjugate base. I need a Kb, not a Ka. But those are related. If you have the Ka, you can use Kw and find the Kb for the reaction that we're interested in. Kb equals products over reactants using the 5% rule to make our life easy. And I find out that the concentration of hydroxide after the back reaction has occurred is right there on the screen. But you're not done. Now you got to do a pH calculation, but you can't take the negative log of this because that would be that'd be a pOH. We got to get to pH. Fourteen minus pOH gives us pH. We get 8.76. And now I want you to stop and make sure that it makes sense. Okay, we have to stop and think whether or not this makes sense. Oops. Hold on. If we have a weak acid and a strong base, my equivalence point should end up basic. Strong base, right? So having a pH a little bit above 7 makes sense. People struggle because they think that neutral means pH 7, right? And they associate that with equal moles of acid and base. But that only works if it's a strong one, because when you mix a strong acid and a strong base, the salt that is produced is not going to hydrolyze. It does not complicate things. But if anything in that mixture is weak, you end up with a buffer. You end up with something hydrolyzing you end up with a little bit of a different reaction occurring. And so while your moles of acid and base may have been equal of what you added to your beaker, your pH is not going to be 7. And I think that people who struggle with these titration calculations are people who struggle with the concepts of salts and the concept of hydrolyzing. If you can do a good job understanding your salts and you can do a good job understanding your conjugates and you can do a good job understanding hydrolyzation, then it will help you 
make sense of the pHs that you're seeing. All right, next one. We're going to go backwards. Now that we know the equivalence point, we can now find the halfway point. If it took 37.5 mils to get to the equivalence point, half of that would be 18.75. And the special thing is that at the halfway point, the pH is the pKa. Which means they gave us the pKa, or they gave us the Ka, didn't they? So pH is negative log of the Ka that they already told us which means we know the pH to plot on our graph at 18.75 mils, we put a little dot at 4.74 pH. Now, why do we care? Why are we going backwards? It helps with the shape of our curve. It really helps us get a good shape. And in reality, sometimes you're doing the titration to find your Ka. That's sometimes the point. So you sometimes are finding that because that's the, the data that you're actually interested in. Okay. Now we need at least one, if not more, points after the equivalence point at the end of our titration. This time, well, we knew it took 37.5 to get to the equivalence point, so let's dump in a whole bunch. Let's go all the way to 50. We've used up the buffer. There's no more acid. We used it all up. Now you have excess hydroxide. So 50 mils of my base at this concentration means this is how many moles I have. You could use those mold charts if you want. You can see this is the moles of acid we began with. This is how much base we've added in. We start with none of these being made. I'm going to use up all of the acid. This is the limiting reagent. So 5 minus 3.75 means I'll have 1.25 left. We need to convert these mole values into concentrations. Now that this is the amount of base that's left over and that's extra, I can just do the pOH of that number, convert that to pH, and now I have a good data point to plot at the end. And you could do this again. Maybe you do 60 mils or 70 mils to get a good shape to your curve. This can be so overwhelming because we can make variations. You know, maybe it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, right? Maybe you're you're going to have a more complicated equation and more complicated stoichiometry. Maybe we give you grams of something and then you got to convert to moles and then you got to convert to concentration and we have scientific notations mixed in and maybe we do the other way. Maybe we have a base and we're adding an acid and the concept is the same but we're kind of flipping our brain to the other direction. Sometimes we're not going to ask you to do every single part of the titration calculations. Maybe we don't need the entire curve. Maybe I only want the halfway point, right? Practice, 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 organized, tidy, neat work, showing your steps, talking to yourself and telling yourself, okay, I am now halfway. 
Now I'm at the equivalence point. Now I'm past the equivalence point. It feels cheesy, but it can be very helpful. Okay, one last thing I want to kind of circle back to. Um, at the very beginning, do you remember I showed you the picture of using an indicator? Once in a while, they may ask you what type of indicator should you use. They will give you charts. You don't have to memorize the different types of chemicals that we use as indicators. They're usually pretty crazy complicated formulas. But if they provide you with the names and they provide you with some information, you can be able to figure it out. So what we want to do is we want to pick an indicator that is somehow related to the equivalence point and where we're going to see the change in color. So what you want to do is you want to look at the range in which the chemical changes color. So you can see here methyl red, a little bit below 5 to a bit above 6. Our, N, our equivalence point would be after that changes colors, wouldn't it? If it changes colors from red to yellow down here, that wouldn't be super helpful, would it? We would think we were done before we were done. If you picked this one, it's going to change from yellow to blue way up here around 9 you would have gone way too far. Here, methyl red would not be a good choice, would it? But look, this one would be a good choice. Thymol blue would be a good choice for this titration because look, when it turns from yellow to blue, that's right about where the equivalence point is. We would have gone a little too far. By the time it's blue, it would be a little too far. But man, way better than if we were down here, right? So there are literally charts. They will tell you the range in which they turn colors. They will often have colorful pictures to show you kind of the color change you'll see. Phenolphthalein is a very classic one. That's the pink one. It goes from clear to pink. In my regular chem class, I do a lab where they use methyl orange. Methyl red. Maybe it's methyl red. I'd have to look. But we get a really pretty reddish orange yellow color. The goal here is that you want to pick one that changes colors in a pH range that is roughly plus or minus one from the pKa of what you're doing. If you know what the Ka is, you can find the pKa. And anything plus or minus one of that, that will work. That gets you a good range. Now, it's not perfect, is it, right? That's what we talked about at the beginning, where using a pH probe and a computer is clearly fabulous. But indicators are just so easy. So if my pKa was 2, which indicator do you think would be good? I think in a 1 to 3 range. Which one changes colors somewhere in about a 1 to 3 pH range? Do you see it right there, thymol blue? 
please don't think you have to memorize these, but if they give you a data chart like this and they say, hey, which indicator should you use? Well, you may have to do some math to figure out what the PKA is. Maybe you know the equivalence point, which lets you find the halfway point, which lets you find the PKA, which then lets you find plus or minus one from the PKA, which then lets you find the indicator to use. Okay, I know that was a lot, but the good news is we have time to practice it. Okay, so you don't have to be perfect at it by tomorrow. You do have plenty of time to practice. Please ask for help if you need it. This is one of the culminating chapters of two years of chemistry. You have been building to this topic for two years. A year of honors chem and almost a full year of AP chem. So we have a lot going on, but you've, you have a lot of great skills. You've had a lot of good practice with ice tables and conversions, right? You can do it. You just got to practice. All right, everybody. I hope that was helpful. Bye.